G'day anti-socialites, this is Ryan Quarrington here. You might remember me from episode 227 and from South Australian band Shatterbrain and Alkira. I'm momentarily commandeering this episode to plug Shatterbrain's debut album, Pitchfork Justice, which is out now via Wormhole Death Records. It's available for streaming wherever you stream your music, or if you're a fan of old school physical, you can pick up a CD or a vinyl along with any other band paraphernalia you can think of via our online store at shatterbrainmetal.com. Thanks for listening, over to you Andy and Larry. Welcome back to the Andy Social Podcast, and before we kick into this episode, Patreon, patreon.com slash Andy Dowling. It is one of the best ways to support this podcast in addition to all the usual things that I know you all do, like subscribing on Apple Podcasts or following on Spotify or sharing all the episodes with your mates and trying to get more and more people to listen to the podcast, you know, all that beautiful stuff that you guys already do. If you want to go one step further, patreon.com slash Andy Dowling is a fantastic way to support and back your mate Andy and his little old podcast, the Andy Social Podcast. Supports us from only a buck a month, dirt cheap, and there are additional tiers to get access to the exclusive Patreon podcast episode that comes out every Tuesday morning, 6 a.m. Sydney time in your ear holes. A bit of fun and to uh, just uh, just do something a little bit silly each and every week. So go and check it all out. Patreon.com slash Andy Dowling. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much for the support. Andy Social. Andy Social. Andy Social. Hey, episode 264 of the Andy Social podcast is here. And this episode is with Liam Anthony. Liam is the drummer and vocalist. Drummer and vocalist. Get that around you. Not too many bands out there do that. There are a few, I know, but not. It's 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 uncommon. It's not it's not a common thing to do. Anyway, the drummer and the and the vocalist from Idle Ruin out of Brisbane, a fantastic band. They've only been around for a short space of time, but Liam has been in the Brisbane metal scene for well probably 15 odd years by now and played in a whole bunch of different bands over the years he's an absolute legend he's a massive supporter of australian metal he uh, used to run a, a, a fanzine which i just absolutely carry on about so much in this podcast episode but um anyway you'll you'll get that in a moment uh called the fallout and uh, he also put together a documentary called thrash or fuck off and uh, it's an australian thrash metal documentary that's on youtube and it's on video on demand as well and i'll have all the links in the show notes of course over at andysocial.net and andydowling.net i'm going to stop crapping on because you're sick of my voice well actually you're not because you're about to listen to about an hour and a half of me talking once again so anyway enough crapping on from me in this intro please enjoy this great chat i have with liam anthony What I'm drinking is Gordon's gin. It's like a cheap gin. It's it's not like the cheapest gin you can get. I think that's probably beef eater or something like that. But yeah, and so, and drinking out of uh, out of what? A McDonald's promo glass. <laughs> that's, uh, <laughs> it's like one of those Coke glasses or something like that. <laughs> You're not recording this for the podcast, are you? Yeah, I just started recording straight away. I'll I'll uh, yeah I'll work it out. I'll. I'll uh, do a bit of, uh, <laughs> bit of editing later. <laughs> uh, okay. I, was, right. I was going to, um, I was going to uh, crack a drink, but then um, I remembered I've, uh, I've given myself a rule for this month where I'm not allowed to drink any alcohol while I'm at home, which means it just means I'm going to be drinking out and about more than more than not. But um, I've got, I've got this tea which apparently makes you shit a lot. Um, Jess calls it poo tea. Um, I don't think it's actually called poo tea, like the technical term, but, uh, she gets it from some Asian grocer, grocer, like around the corner. Um, yeah. and, uh, apparently it works. So if, uh, I may shit myself during this podcast. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah. Um, this is an I we're on, we're doing a keto diet at the moment, so I mm-hmm. can't really drink. I can't be on the beers or anything and sh- She's drinking wine. I, I I can't actually drink wine for um because I've got like a, a weird food allergy. But um so yeah, just uh, gin and soda for me. Oh, I think that's probably the safe bet, and um, uh, no doubt a blessing in disguise to not be able to stomach wine because really, I mean, there's, sometimes it's nice to have a glass now and then, but uh, usually drinking wine ends ends in misery. So yeah, it's uh yeah one less one less worry for you. I suppose so. I suppose so. <laughs> well, um, I, I had a whole bunch of different things to talk about, and and I mean, you you know how it all works. We go go off on a bunch of different tangents, but uh, just by chance, like it was completely co- a co- complete co- coincidence. If I can even fucking talk properly, um, but I was uh, doing a bit of uh, spring cleaning, and I came across an old artifact, and I thought, fucking, this is timely, and uh, it's edition eleven of the Fallout magazine. 
<laughs> that whole thing, yeah. And um, I'll tell you what, it's like a, it's a heavy metal art- artifact now. It's an Australian heavy metal artifact. I was flicking through it and it brought back so many memories. And I guess the reason why I've got it is there's a little write-up uh, of us in, in this particular one. But uh, there's stuff here from like, you know, us and Voyager, Killraiser, Bellacore. Then there's some international stuff, Rob Halford, Overkill, uh, Arch Enemy, uh, Destroyer 666. And uh, uh, what else is there? There's a, there's a Scream Fest review, Metal Over Darwin review. Um, oh, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, that was the uh, Spinal Tap edition, I think. I asked every band a question, what was, what, what was your Spinal Tap moment? Because it was edition 11, so it made sense, right? <laughs> I love it. Oh, mate. It, I mean, it's, it really got me thinking about about the opportunities missed and not not so much with this because I think you, you did such a great job of it and I just think about now and with the internet and everything like that I just I have this roman- romantic sort of thought in the back of my head that things like this could potentially make a comeback because they're just so so much of a throwback old school sort of nostalgic sort of thing that it's such a an opposite to what we're used to now where everything's on our phones or on laptops or whatever, that to have something, you know, this, this little, little fanzine to, to be sent out to people and to get it and, and just a little bit of an update in the metal world and especially sort of heavily, you know, Aussie, Aussie focused is, um, I don't know, there's something really cool about it. I mean, I guess the reality of it is probably wouldn't be ultra successful, but um, I just kept looking at them and the cogs are turning for me. I'm like, oh, oh, oh maybe maybe somebody should should do a, a, a 2021 version of this. Maybe. And funny you say that because like oh, a, a few weeks ago, I actually had a dream um, about that old zine. And like I had a dream that I was actually making it again, but like, oh, I've got a bit more money in the bank. I can make it all glossy and, and, and colour. And then, then when I woke up, I was thinking about that. I was like, oh, yeah, that could be cool. And then I'm just slapping myself on the hand, being like, no, you've got enough of your already. Don't go chasing that. <laughs> <laughs> oh, no. Uh, it just, I think it's one of those things where, like, like a lot of things that we do, they become a, a labor of love and mm. they're never a financial success or, or not, even, not even to a point where they're financially sustainable, where you can just, just cover your costs. It's usually a, a drain of the bank account and you just do it because you love it. But... Yep. Um, yeah, that yeah. essentially was it, and basically because I, I, I don't know. Even even now, um, I, and and even then, I've always loved research, and that was really just as much as I was trying to document the scene or or, or do any sort of newsletter for the for Australian metal. Um, when I look back on it, a lot of it was really for my own personal re- research and on the Australian scene, and trying to tell people, hey, like. Look, look inward in your backyard. We have so so many kick-ass bands here. Sure, you've got your Metallicas and, and your Iron Maidens and whatever overseas. But if you just turn around and look inward, look what we got. And look what they're doing. Yeah, yeah. And, I mean, I don't, oh, has it got a year on the front of this? I don't think it does. That was uh, 2009 or 2010. Yeah, yeah, potentially. Yeah, there's a couple of... Uh, there's a couple of gig reviews in the back, and um, what do we got here? We got uh, Destroyer, mm. uh, the Hi Fi January 2010. So, and then there's a Slayer, Megadeth, uh, and Double Dragon. They supported at the River Stage. There you go in, 20, in 2009. So, um, so it must be 2010. But yeah. Um, yeah, I love it. And I guess it's it's funny, like the way that you described it, then, because it's almost like, and I've been harping on about it, this is like a hell of a lot for for a long time about the whole the whole networking thing and bands mm. being proactive and trying to learn about you know what's going on in your backyard and and trying to understand who's who and what the bands are and try and form some alliances and and get some shows together and build build you know what you've got instead of you know lusting for for what's over the pond over the other side of the world or whatever it might be and mm. it's kind of like you you sort of did that but then you sort of went well while I'm learning and while I'm documenting everything, I may as well share it with everybody else and, and, uh, and put it into this, this cool fanzine. And, and I think even like what you mentioned before, like, you know, having this dream and going, oh, you know, I've got a bit of money now, I can, you know, gloss it up and, and put it into color and everything. I mean, for people that I might take a photo, actually, I'll, I'll chuck it, I'll chuck it on the page so people can have a look at it. But, um, <laughs> I, I, it's, but it's awesome. And I think, I mean, maybe it's just me and maybe I'm not the consensus, but just the way that you did it, I mean, it's black and white. 
And it's just, it's such a retro thing and it's so underground and old school. And I sort of have, I daydream about this sort of stuff. And I'm like, what if you had like something like this where putting the cost aside just for a moment and let's, let's, let's just think a little bit lofty here. But if you're able to create something like this today and it became like not a letterbox drop where it's just, you're wasting it on people that aren't, aren't interested, but it became like, you know, a street press and it became something that could be picked up at a local high school where kids are getting into heavy music and, and it's sort of just, it links into that next generation of people where they, they can, uh, they can totally sort of learn about, uh, about what's going on around them and heavy music. But, but once again, I mean, this is me, you know, it's turning into an elder statesman now and, uh, <laughs> and not keeping up with, with what the young kids are, are up to these days. And I know that this would just absolutely flop and die at its ass, but, um, fuck, it's nice to dream. Cause I think this would just be such a cool, a cool thing for people to look forward to and, and just keep up to date with what's going on. Well, yeah, thank you. Thank you very much. Um, I think, yeah, I don't think I even have any of my copies of the fallout even in my possession anymore, but <laughs> I don't know where they've gone, but, uh, but yeah, like I said, that, that did, that did start off as like, um, sort of a newsletter, just a, a simple two page newsletter I did about Brisbane bands and it sort of grew from there. And, um, I remember like the, 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 one of the larger editions that I did, I think the very first, um, of the larger editions that I did back in 2006, I think, um, there was like an editorial about like, you know, why is Australian metal not as, you know, prominent as the U S and European scenes. And mm. I think I spoke to you and Tim, I think Matt from mortal sin, um, Scotty from minus life as well. Just, you know, asking, you know, um, you know, you, you guys have been there in some pretty key moments of when the Australian metal scene has, you know, either grown or, or changed. What's your your take on why we're not as big as Europe and, and, and US? And it kind of spiraled from there. Um, uh, you know, just talking to bands um, and, you know, just and also that 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 whole sort of um, sharing with everyone being like, you know, hey, look at these bands, check them out. Look what they're doing. You know, we're not we're not all just a bunch of, you know, pub bands every every weekend there are some bands that are really kicking ass kicking goals just check it out and um you know i i was pretty young and naive when i wrote those magazines and i i look at some of the shit that i wrote and i cringe and I, anyone who does anyone who chases any copies of those of those magazines down now and reads them and and and, and starts laughing or cringing look i don't blame you <laughs> i was i was i was a young naive uh i think i was about 18 or 19 when i wrote those so <laughs> i think you'd even even put uh, pulled me aside and say, "Hey, look, you know that's not how you write a review, Liam, or something like that." Oh, who knows? Who knows? I mean, but even even for me, like, I just, I mean, it's it's kind of like the social media stuff now. We get those Facebook memories, and even like a few yeah. years ago, I look at that and go, "Oh my god, delete, get rid of it quick before anybody, especially if other people have been tagged in a post." I go, "Oh, quick, remove it, remove the evidence because it's just yeah. uh, just some rubbish there." But uh, I don't know, man. I, I I think it's it's a little bit of a time capsule of of what was going on, you know, a decade ago <laughs> now. Like it, it's just, it's crazy, like how much time's passed. But um, just to go through mm. and and even just see the bands. I mean, there's a lot of a lot of Aussie stuff that's being covered here. Some some interviews and reviews and things like that. And just to see who's still kicking, like who's still out there playing music, mm. what bands Absolutely. don't exist anymore, and um, or what they've evolved into or changed into. And um, yeah, it's it's cool. It's just a little little bit of a documented artifact now where you know well at least I'm, I'm getting the kick out of it nice nice and there was one section i always used to do towards the end um and this was before youtube and and you know labels were re-releasing um obscure bands or cult bands where I'd, I'd do an article just on a band that like it wasn't it wasn't so much of where are they now but more of a um Hey, this this band, you know, they had quite an influence on a lot of prominent bands. Um, you know, they may have only released one or two albums, but this is what they did. This is what they got up to. And the thing was, when I when I a lot of those bands um, I interviewed as well, like I'd contact them and be like, Hey, look, I'm doing this piece on you. Would you like to chat? And they'd be like, Hey, why is this 18 year old 
guy <laughs> the other side of the world contacting us, you know, 10, 15 years later. But, hey, we'll do it. And, um, you know, they, they, they get flattered on that stuff. And, um, you know, now, nowadays it's, it's, not, it's, it's not as special as it was 10, 15 years ago. You know, you're getting a lot of bands getting their re-releases or, you know, um, so many young followers just following them on um, – on YouTube or they, they're, they're re-releasing their stuff, you know, on their own through Bandcamp or Spotify or whatever. But uh, at that time, you know, it was like digging up all these, all these buried treasures. It was, it was a, from, from my end, it was a cool feeling. And all these, all, all the readers were like, wow, I didn't know about this band. I'm going to go check them out. Where do I find their stuff? I'm like, well, about that. <laughs> <laughs> you might struggle. You might struggle. I'm just looking now. I think the one that you did in this one was, uh, was Watchtower. And uh, yeah. a little bit of a write up there. It's 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 cool. I mean, it's 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 a it's a nice little throwback to see you know digging into the into the metal archives. It's it's to see what 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 bands were forgotten. I think that's the I mean, it's a good thing about music in general. But you know, just especially metal, where there was just so many bands that came out, and obviously the the, the big hitters were the ones that grabbed everyone's attention. But there are a lot of other bands who are possibly as good, or if not better, um, but just didn't just weren't in the right place, right time and were forgotten. And there's a, there's a torrent website. I can't remember the name of it. Um, but it just, it's focused purely on really, really underground metal releases from like the eighties and the nineties. And it's just incredible. And there's a lot of Aussie stuff on there and stuff that I've never heard of. And I'm just slowly sifting through it at the moment, just trying to learn about a lot of bands that have just been absolutely forgotten. And they've only ever released like a, like a little demo or a seven inch or something like that. And someone's, managed to digitize it and and their mp3 downloads and it's just it's incredible to to discover what bands were out there and just literally got left in the dust and it all it all also makes me think now although you know everything's documented a lot more online and everyone's on the internet but how many bands are probably not doing a really good job even now documenting themselves putting things online and making sure people can find them even long after they've you know they've disbanded and, and moved on yeah, definitely. And uh, in my opinion, and I think in a lot of people's opinion, like if you if you look at the history of progressive metal, Watchtower were one of the pioneers that really melded, um, you know, your Russians, your Yeses, your Genesises, whatever, with Thrash. You know, this this was before Dream Theater, like those those kind of bands that really pioneered the whole progressive metal um, thing, and um, you know, I, I, I believe they, they were just as worthy uh, as Dream Theater or Fate's Warning or Pain of Salvation. Totally. Yeah, yeah. And, but then, you know, it comes back to, to this, this, this creation of yours. I mean, there would have been so many people who would have never have heard of the band. And I think, um, I've just lost the page now, but um, I think just in sort of the, the little, uh, little, little intro and it's just talking about sort of referencing dream theater and and some progressive bands and it references uh queen's uh, operation mind crime and so yeah. straight away you sort of you're giving people a reference point and so suddenly you know straight away you go well i fucking love queen's rock but i've never heard of watchtower so instantly i'm motivated to to learn a little bit more and so there's an effort there just to say it's not just a a band who i'm going to just tell you sounds really cool i'm i'm going to give you a few a few uh a few points of reference so you can you can get a bit of an understanding of what potentially you're gonna you're gonna be checking out if you're able to find the music yeah exactly and who knows whoever's listening to this now could be like who the hell is watchtower and go check them out that's it well uh for from the looks of it i don't know if these websites still exist i mean who knows they could be on spotify i or could be could be wrong but uh what uh, we got? Uh, yeah, I think I think they are. Yeah, oh, there you go. That might make it easy. Otherwise, there's a <laughs> it's a MySpace page. <laughs> <laughs> oh, MySpace. Yeah. So um, yeah, but it's cool. It's it's. I mean, I love it. I, I wasn't I wasn't uh, sort of aiming to to have a whole podcast about uh, the fallout, but um, I was I was just super pumped when I found it. I thought this is so fucking just the best timing to to find this um just before before catching up with you and 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 one more thing i'll i'll, I'll touch on as well so i'm hoping that somebody listening to this is a, just as motivated as what you were or what i am at the moment just hyping myself up, up over this <laughs> and somebody actually takes a stab at doing something like this and does it like a really it's very punkish it's very punk the way that you did it and it's very grassroots but the last page on it 
has got like um, just a very simplified sort of table and it says metal venues in Australia and then it's got Aussie uh, metal radio shows, distros and zines and it's sort of like a reference point there and that reminds me of buying a record or buying a CD and you're going into the liner notes to see who Metallica thanked or who Iron Maiden thanked and then you, that's your reference point to check out the next bands that are referenced in the back of the liner notes. And for stuff like this, for somebody who's brand new to the scene and has no idea about any of the bands, they're just getting the heavy music, they want to go out to shows, or even just they started a band. I mean, stuff like that's awesome because you go, oh, cool, I can start ticking the list and working out who I need to contact or what I can look up or what I can listen to and and learn more about uh, about heavy music in Australia. So, yeah, this stuff this stuff gets me pumped, mate. <laughs> <I'm just> sucked. <laughs> Oh. Very cool. Yeah. I mean, yeah, that was, that was the whole idea was just trying, trying to, again, you know, just explain to people, Hey, this is what we got, you know, um, here's your local venue. Here's your local radio show. Get out there, check it out. And, um, yeah, in the, in the back page, I think I even had, uh, labels and distros as well yeah. in the back page. Yeah. yeah. Just, um, showing people, you know, who, who are bands, who are fans, this is where you get your metal. This is where you see your metal. This is where you hear your metal, you know, just, um, a directory of of sorts, I guess. Yeah. Yeah, it's great. It's great. How how um how regular were you putting them out? Was it sort of once every couple of months or something like that? Um, originally when I when it was just like a two page newsletter, it was uh, once a month. Um, and I think when it went to a full fanzine, like about probably thirty pages, it was like once every quarter. Hmm. Um, and I think when the when um, I think around 2008, 2009, it started becoming like I think about three, three, two or three a year. Um, it was it was becoming less frequent as you know you know life happens. You mm. get um, um, thing, things things change, priorities change, and um, and also you know the, the the zines were getting bigger, and I had to dedicate more time and. Um, you know, more content. So it was just becoming less and less frequent until, um, eventually, uh, I, I think I went entirely online where it was all just a PDF, a, z a PDF scene. And that was coming out, I think once a month, I went back to a monthly format and, uh, I had more freedom to, you know, um, put as much content as I wanted, put it all together as, as quickly as I could and get it out, as, you know, without having to rely on a third party. I think the, the eighth edition I sent to a printer and they completely fucked up the, um, the page order. And I, there was an interview with um, Tabra in there that they completely removed. I'm just like, guys, what the hell have you done? <laughs> Uh, so like, you know, having, having, um, having it as a completely digital zine, as a PDF zine that people could just download, you know, there was, there, there were fewer resources, fewer costs. And, you know, I had complete control of how, how many pages and, 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 and what I could put in and, and it didn't matter. And, um, the last one I did, I think was a bastardizer, uh, not sorry, bastardizer, bastard fest. Oh, Bastard yeah. Fest special in 2011, and uh, it was it was just featuring all the bands from Bastard Fest, and um, by that time, like M Malachite, the band I was in at the time, they were hitting full throttle, and I I just didn't have time to do the zine anymore, so I I, I kind of let it to rest after that. I mean, it's a lot of work. It's it's a ton of work. I mean, even just looking at this one, you know, just so many. You know, the interviews alone, you know, coordinating mm. those and getting them together and then your write-ups, your reviews. And the, and and even at the start, you, I mean, you've got a lot of people contributing and, and, and helping along the way, but you've got to get everyone aligned and, and yeah, helping absolutely. out. And it's a, it's a, it's a big, it's a big thing. And, and I guess that's the, that's the issue with a lot of the ideas and the great things that, that do come out from time to time is, is, uh, it's not so much about how much of an impact you have straight away. It's the longevity of something and, if you can, if you can hold on and keep chugging away, then, you know, long-term you, you come out, you come out strong, but, um, just, I think a lot of people start things with good intentions and then, um, and then just can't, can't maintain it for a whole range of, in most cases, legit, legitimate reasons. Like you said before, like life, life just happens and mm. priorities change. Um, because yeah, even, 
you know, even me sort of getting myself pumped up going, oh yeah, how could I do this? How could I do this? That would be really easy. I can, if I can maintain it, but at the same time in the back of my head, I'm like, no, you're an idiot. Uh, exactly what you said before, like, yeah, uh, doing too many things already, you know, don't overcommit to something, you know, that you, you, you're set up to fail. So, but, <laughs> um, but yeah, I, don't, I just, I just hope somebody else has an idea, even if it's like you said, the PDF version or something like that, that gets sent out. And I know there are some web zines that do stuff like that, but, um, I don't know. I just, uh, love the vibe, mate. Well, cheers. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So enough, enough of Fallout magazine, because I'll probably come back to it anyway, because I'm, I'm just staring at it. So it'll probably trigger another thought later on, but, um, uh, probably a, a good little, little, uh, segue is, um, the uh, the documentary stuff that you've been doing over the past few years, um, sure, is that sort of, I guess, that kind of stuff that you've been doing is more or less an extension of Fallout. Like, I mean, just I guess the same sort of mindset behind it, trying to learn and, and trying to document it and share it to, to more people. Is that sort of, I guess, the nutshell of where it's all come from or the motivation to to start getting into a little bit more of a, a video aspect of documenting things? I, I guess so. I never really thought of it that way, but <clears throat> in hindsight. You could look at that that way, because um, I mean, I went after Malachite um, fell apart. I went and started at uni. I went and did a uni course, and um, I learned how to properly research. You know, be more objective about things. Um, <laughs> and uh, I met Chalky Hill, the uh, drummer of Derain, uh, the band he was in at the time. And um, the video thing actually sort of came about when I was in Malachite and I sort of followed, believe it or not, I was actually sort of following you guys where you guys would take your camera on the road or do like some video content about, you know, I think Tim did a video about like voting for the next film clip from the Set in Stone album or something like that. And I'm like, oh, you know, we got to do more things like that. And so I would take my camera on, even if we were just doing a, a road trip down to Melbourne to do a show, I would take the camera on, and on, on the road with me and we would film, you know, on tour shenanigans as well as the gig. And I got really good at editing and, um, we did a same, the same thing for our, um, when we were recording the album, you know, just that, that, that extra, uh, extension of the band, what's going on behind the scenes when you're not, seeing the band on stage or whatever and um so i met chalky and he said he started doing the same thing he was saying well i always loved what malachite were doing when they were doing um the video content and the video documentaries and the tour reels and all that sort of stuff and um one night uh i was out having dinner with uh, my partner and um she brought she, she we were talking about chalky's videos and stuff and she she brought up um well why don't you and chalky make a documentary video about the brisbane thrash scene because you know you've all got this kinship going on there's this local community going on like why don't you just do that and i said well that's actually a good idea mm. um and like about i think 10 years ago um there was a fellow who wanted me to help him make a documentary about the australian metal scene but that guy turned Anyway, I'm not going to go into that. That 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 was a whole shit show. Different story. <laughs> Different story. That guy was. Anyway, he got. Anyway, um, <laughs> and I thought, well, okay, um, yeah, why the hell not? I'll I'll give it another go. And uh, Chalky and I, we started making, we started interviewing bands like the the Brisbane bands, um, like Caustic Attack, Asylum, Malachite. Um, no, I was not interviewing myself because I was out of the band at the time. Uh, <laughs> Derain, all that, all those, all those bands that were in Brisbane. But it was the same night Elm Street were playing, so we're like, okay, let's get them as well. Um, and it kind of sp expanded and spiraled from, okay, we've got the Brisbane scene, we've got a Melbourne band. Let's talk to Harlot. Let's talk to In Mouse's Wake. Let's talk to. Um, Fenrir, let's talk to all these great bands that are just, you know, happening right now. And then um, I thought, well, we've, if, if we're going to talk Australian thrash, we've got to we've got to include Mortal Sin. I mean, that's just a given. Mm. And spoke to Matt and Wayne. Um, who else did we talk to? And then, you know, Scott McMahon, um, 
who's uh who does the um, Metal Zone radio show in Melbourne. He was like, well, I, I know some guys from the old Melbourne days, um, you know, Mass Confusion, um, Peter Hobbs, all them. Can I get them on for you? I'm like, yeah, absolutely, man. Go for it. And so, yeah, we got, you know, the guys from Renegade. Mm. And then I was like, I know one more band. I know one more band. And we got <laughs> – and then when Witch Skull came to Brisbane, it's like, oh, we got to speak to Joel. You know, he was in Armored Angel. And then Steve Hughes was touring Brisbane. Oh, we got to get him. as well. It all just expanded, expanded, expanded. The scope kept on getting bigger and bigger and bigger. And um, at the same time, I was doing a, a research paper at, at uni. So I was learning how to, you know, just – what was starting off as just like a um, a just a celebration of the Brisbane scene when I was doing my research paper and learning how to research properly. And it's just like, okay, what the hell is the point of this? What the hell is the point of this video? And when I was talking to more of the older scene um, thrashers and, and whatnot, you know, they were talking about how the Australian thrash scene really was – the foundational aspect to what became of Australian metal today. Like you had your first um, local Australian metal label. You had your first record shops, like your metal for Melbourne and your utopias and whatnot. You know, you had your first um, dedicated promoters and also like, you know, the struggles that the, these, these bands had in the face of pub rock and all that sort of thing, you know, you, they were they were playing gigs with with your standard sort of pub rock bands, and the the audience would get bored listening to this. I'm like, what the hell is this? Is this is this this isn't punk? It's not quite ACDC. What is this? Mm-hmm. Right? And I thought, okay, well, this is the point. This is the point of the documentary. Um, this is what we're talking. This this was the golden age of Australian heavy metal. It it, it lay the foundation for what we have today and then later on you had your sadistic execution your your bremelins your damaged and and all that sort of stuff sort of sort of took off from there um so whether it was a, an extension of the fallout i don't know maybe in hindsight maybe maybe it was but um it really was just a celebration of my favorite genre and um also just you know uh, a labor of love just explaining like okay this is what helped construct Australian metal um, as we know it. it. It's probably, um, I guess, the, the same itch that you're scratching when you're doing the the fanzine. Is it probably a similar itch that you were you were scratching while you know going through and just gathering all these these interviews and these chats with with all these different people and just digging deeper? It's just your own you know personal fascination with with you know a, a community that that you love and you're passionate about. And I guess it's just a, you know, whether, you know, obviously not conscious of it at the time, but, um, you know, just a natural sort of progression. And it's cool just to know, cause I didn't realize that it sort of just started off as, uh, let's just, uh, sort of document our, our backyard in Brisbane and just sort of get, get those guys there. And then just, just by chance, it sort of ex- ex- expanded and went and went from there. Did at what point in time, when you're getting all this together, had you thought about how you're going to package it and how you're going to put it out and the branding around and all that sort of stuff? Was that sort of, did that come fairly quickly once you started digging into, into that whole sort of, you know, eighties sort of metal, metal scene down there? Was it sort of around that time where you thought, okay, this is, this is something that we, we need to do. We've got a bit of a vision now of how we want to do it. I would say, yeah, it was, it was around that time when we started digging, more into the 80s scene probably probably when i started interviewing um the guys from renegade because that was when they were starting to say hey like you know we were when we first started on the scene like you know, arguably they were the first australian speed thrash metal band they were saying you know we struggled to make a name for ourselves live because you know people couldn't take us seriously as a new genre or whatever and um that was when it when it <laughs> pardon me that was when it really started to um fall into its own was when we were interviewing renegade and um uh that was when the story the the sort of narrative structure started to 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 really form did you have the same sort of feeling from people or even feedback direct feedback from some of these bands like you know just going back before when we're talking about you know watchtower and some of these these uh, throwback bands that you'd highlight in, in your fanzine, were you having s- similar sort of 
situations with a lot of these bands who probably never, apart from their inner circle of mates that they've grown up with and probably stayed in contact with, have never really sort of probably done an interview for quite a few years or, or even spoken about it in a little bit more of a public public space. Did you, did you sort of get a bit of a vibe from them that there were, there was a bit of a novelty and they were a bit excited about it or, or even maybe even a, just a, it could be the other way, like a little bit bitter about sort of what could have been and what, what didn't end up happening or, or whatever. Did you get some of those vibes? Absolutely, yeah. Um, the guys from Sudafed, who were an Adelaide speed metal band, they were they were really really chuffed that um, they were thought of and and remembered and you know being immortalized, I guess. And uh, same same with Michael Heslop from uh, Berserker, mm. rest in peace. Um, yeah, he went, him and I just we had we had a great chat. Like that 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 interview just. Um, that was probably one of my favorite interviews that I, that I did for the whole project. And, um, he, he just loved, uh, talking about all the stuff that Berserker had got up to, um, just reliving those moments. And same with, uh, Joel from, uh, Armand Angel. Uh, he had, he had a great time just, just telling me about all the stuff in the Canberra scene, you know, how him and, uh, Lucy from Armand Angel, uh, they, worked a record store and were just helping, you know, build and cultivate their, their scene and um, how they, they organize their own gigs and all that sort of stuff. You know, it was that human element that as well, like they, they just, you could, you could really feel the passion from these people that I was interviewing. Um, they obviously loved what they did. They obviously look back on it with fond memories and they, 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 they felt honored that, um, it was being, you know, recognized, I guess. Yeah. I, I love that. I mean, I, I, I get that every once in a while, like just doing this podcast and I reach out to somebody who, who probably hasn't done a podcast or doesn't even know what a podcast is. Sometimes they're the toughest ones. Cause I have to go through a whole education piece and go, okay, so this is podcast started in uh, you know the late nineties and blah, 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 and whatever, and go through this whole thing with them. But, um, but a lot of people that, that I get to chat with, you know, there's that, there's almost like this air of relief sometimes where they're, they're able to talk and, and have a chat and talk about something that they really give a shit about or, or gave a shit about many years ago. And mm. nobody has really sort of asked them the questions or let them tell their story for, for quite a, quite a long time. Cause a lot of these guys who, you know, some of these like Joel, Joel from, you know, obviously he's got witch skull these days and he's still, he's still getting about, but, um, you know, there's a lot of these guys who have not played or, or probably haven't been to a lot of metal gigs for, for many, many years. And they've got families and they've probably just got a, a very small circle of mates and that's about it. And so they probably haven't had a chance to talk about all of this stuff for, for a very long time. So I think just that, that air of relief that I've certainly felt from, from people who have been able to talk, it's, it's really cool. Like I, I love, I love that feeling and sort of, I think as a, as somebody who enjoys talking to people and, and hearing people's stories, I, I get really excited. It's like uncovering something. And I guess that's sort of mm. the approach with, you know, the documentary. It's like, what, you know, what are we uncovering here? What do we want to highlight? What are we going to discover along the way? And, um, and I certainly, I certainly got that, you know, cause there's so much that I had no idea about. I mean, I'm a lot of bands that I'd sort of been aware of, or I'd bumped into some of the, some of the old legacy, legacy metalheads. Um, <laughs> and they, they told me their stories or what bands they used to play in and you connect the dots. But I think what you guys put together, I think it, it uncovered so much. I had no clue about, and, um, I think you guys did just a, a top job. Well, thank you. Thank you. My personal favorite episode is, um, probably episode four, um, where it really goes into the, the DIY aspect of the bands of, of the eighties, how like they, um, had to distribute their their albums on their own how they uh like all the radio shows in each state and every as well um all the record labels and 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 then eventually the bands that finally cracked the overseas market from australia and um not not just talking to the bands and be like hey um what did you do as a band but like how did you get there um and i guess again that comes back to that whole um documentation of the of of your own backyard and and uh showing people how it was did you did you learn anything yourself i mean apart from just piecing together the history and and you know understanding sort of what bands existed and who did what and all that sort of stuff but you know just even the diy stuff for for example 
Were there sort of things that you sort of connected the dots as a, as a musician yourself and somebody who's been, been in the metal scene for quite a few years now, did you sort of go, oh, like I, you know, maybe, maybe subconsciously knew some of this stuff, but sort of, it was a little bit more prevalent or a little bit more obvious once you started, you know, getting all these stories together? A little bit. Yeah. Like, um, I didn't know how Mortal Sin got their, um, got their record recognized in, in the UK, for example. Um, because I have a DVD of theirs from it's called Out of the Darkness, where they're just they're just talking about like you know they they, they released Mayhemic Destruction, but then it sort of cuts to like it getting reviews in in um, Metal Forces magazine and all that sort of stuff. But like Matt went into detail about like how it was mistaken for a Metallica record, and a record <laughs> exec walks into a record store and is like, oh, this is brilliant! I'll I've, I've got to call these guys. So I, I love that, you know. Um, that kind of thing. And, you know, I, I, I didn't really know how much of a struggle like the, the Melbourne scene originally went through in the face of pub rock and, and all that sort of thing. And, um, you know, also the, the, um, initial crossover into death metal with band, like, the early bands like persecution and also misery mm. and, uh, sadistic execution, whatnot. But, um, and, uh, I, I, I learned a lot about like the influence that, um, early Australian death metal even had on the overseas market. Like I knew there was a lot of tape trading going on between um, Australia and Europe, especially with bands like Slaughter Lord, but I didn't know how much of an impact they had. Um, I, I kind of subconsciously knew, but I didn't really know how much to, how much of an extent they had. And um, that was really fascinating as well. Learning, learning about that. Yeah, that, that blows me away. And I think um, for me, I've only just really come to appreciate that in, in recent years where I think, especially from, from my sort of my own path through music, I've always sort of held that, that badge of, of pride being sort of the underdog living in the arse end of the world and always got something to prove. And it's very Aussie as well. And, mm. and, and obviously being, you know, a metal band as well, you're always, you always are uh, underrated in the grand scheme of things. And um, I've just always thought about, you know, Australia's neglected, forgotten about, and it's only sort of been in recent years where, you know, there's, there, there were a few bands here and there that had some success over, overseas, but um, really in the last sort of 10, 15 years now that bands have, have really made a, na a name for themselves. But um, yeah, it's only been recently where I've really sort of paid attention to some of those earlier stories and, and, and like stuff that you've highlighted and, and even people that I've spoken to on the podcast and, and yeah, like the tape trading stuff and the connections and the friends that they had. And it's like, oh, you, you guys were friends with, you know, mayhem and, and, you know, Bathory yeah, exactly, and all these guys yeah. and, and, and they were all influenced by, by you guys. And it's like, you gotta be fucking joking. It's incredible. And, you just, <laughs> and, you know, for us, when you get into metal, you're, it's whatever's popular at the moment or whatever's being traded and passed around and everything like that. And. You know, if you if you like extreme metal, then you gravitate towards you know all the Scandinavian stuff and 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 so or you know death metal could be Florida and whatever it is. And then yeah, but as you dig in deeper, you, you start to find these really surprising connections with uh, with some of these guys that you know would be classed as heavy metal heroes, as cheesy as it sounds, and they know guys from our past. And it's like oh right. Actually, one of the guys I interviewed, um, Chad Morbid, he. Mm. Um, he made a very, very interesting point where, like, there was the first wave of of um, black and death metal, like your Venoms, your your Creators, your Possessed, whatever, and um, they were influential on bands like Slaughter Lord and Sadistic Execution and Arm and Angel, who then had an influence on a lot of the Scandinavian scene. And he said, "Well, where's the second wave? That's just one linear tie right there." Mm. I thought that was very, very interesting what he said. Yeah. And, and I guess these days, I mean, it's, it's a completely different landscape with, with the way that we're all connected and, and especially like in the last, you know, 12 months or so, everyone's been more or less cooped up at home. Um, mm. You sort of forget about geography, you forget about where people are in the world because we're just all talking, connecting all the time. And it'll be interesting, you know, in 10 years time or 20 years time down the track to see how much... Australian bands have influenced a lot of other bands around the world. And I know that that, that already happens now, but, um, mm -hmm. as, as those borders start to sort of fade away online, at least virtually, um, it'll, yeah, I think it'll just be a completely different thing. I don't think it'll be so 
such a crazy concept or such a surprising concept down the track where, you know, I think for many years because we couldn't just easily communicate, it was letters, white mail and, you know, sending, <laughs> sending the cassettes and all that sort of stuff. It took months to get, get answers. And so communication was so slow. So it took a long time to build, build scenes and build awareness of bands and releases and all that sort of stuff. So yeah, it's, it's, it's cool. And I mean, one thing that I learned, you know, watching a lot of this stuff and, and hearing the stories is just how some stuff just remains the same, you know, like it's, it might be a different, different tools that are used now, but you know, building, building, building the tribe, building the community of people, building your, your, your legion of, of dedicated supporters that go out and, and wear your colors, you know, so to speak, you know, wearing your band t-shirts and whatever it is and flying the flag for, for your band or for the, for the, for metal or for the genre of metal, or whatever it is. And that stuff's exactly the same now. It's just, um, you know, different tools in the toolkit to, to make that happen. But, um, I, I love hearing those old school stories of how, how guys have had to try and, you know, you know, flyer and, and do little, you know, fanzines and all sorts of stuff and tape trade and all that sort of stuff just to get, just to get their names out there and connect with people and network. Absolutely. And what's interesting about, you know, you and you and I, like our generation, we've, we've witnessed such a, a transition from the physical to, to a completely digital. And, um, yeah, it's just been such an interesting change as well for how bands get out there. And, uh, I mean, um, the, the the tools do make it easy, but at the same time, you know, you've you've the, because so many people around the world have the same idea. It's it, yeah. There's 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 a lot more going on as well. Yeah, it's, there are a lot more bands doing the same thing. Yeah, it's tough. It's it's tough now. It's a different type of challenge. I think. Um, Absolutely. I think I think the thing that stays the same is that everyone's trying to be heard. Um, but it's just there's different there's different roadblocks now of things that you have to navigate around and and you know like going back to what i said before like you know as as uh as as sort of ancient as these fanzines are and you know i knew i was gonna look i knew i was gonna reference it again because i'm looking straight at it. i keep picking it up <laughs> keep but, going back to yeah, that keep going back to it this is this is my base of this conversation now but um you know as i look at this and i'm talking about you know nostalgic stuff sometimes a little bit of a throwback and something that's a little bit nostalgic can cut through the noise. And it's, and even if it's not a, even if it's just a flash in the pan, sort of a very sort of quick thing that won't last, um, it might be things like that could be what you need to cut through the noise and be a little bit different. Um, even just for a very short period of time, because, um, because yeah, we're, we're used to our, well, you know, at one point it was our emails getting clogged up with, you know, all sorts of crap. Um, still get a little bit of that these days, but more or less now it's, you know, oh, for a while there was Facebook event in invites and getting all that sort of stuff through. And then, you know, mass messages or, you know, for a while there we had text messages and people, uh, text mailing lists. That was fucking annoying. That was, and, oh, and all these different things like, but it's all digital and we're all sort of in, in a mix flicking through a news feed and everyone's trying to haul themselves out and talk about their, what they're up to and. It's great, but it's very hard to sort of go. Well, why do I pay attention to this one over over something else? And maybe, maybe a, a little a little dash of the old school might uh, might help some bands out. Just uh, cut through some of that some of that digital noise. I think the important thing these days is to be engaging. Like, try and engage with your um, your fans as, as best as possible. Like, I, I don't want to put anyone down, but like, I, I see a lot of bands. They just be like, "Hey, we're a band. Here's our recording." like here it is it's just yeah. like okay why do i give a shit about you mm. if you can be engaging to your to your um your fans um and this is what i was coming back to uh when when i was uh, inspired by a lot of the stuff that tim was doing with the video content and all that, that sort of stuff that to me showed you guys were more than just a band that goes out and plays every weekend his recording, it, 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 it was a hook. Mm. And if bands can keep doing that, great. Um, and I, what I, what I do for, uh, for work is, is, is front end development. And I also incorporate a lot of what's called user experience. So how to make a um, user interface on whether it's a computer or a, or a phone or even a product more engaging, more user and user friendly for, um, for its user and i think the same thing can be applied to being in a band your users are your audience how do you make yourselves more palatable more engaging more um 
you know, more out there for your fans and more enjoyable for your fans. Um, how do you put yourself past, you know, that, that, that band that's just on social media being like, Hey, we're a band. Here's our recording. Go for it. Um, you know, building a persona, building, um, better hooks to your music, even just, you know, writing music that is, that is engaging to, to the audience. If, because we have so much noise and so many bands that are just out there, digital, it is so easy to produce and release music. How do you get in front? Mm. And, and, and in, in my experience, it's being, it's, it's about engagement. It's about, um, yeah, how do you how do you feed the masses the the right way? Yeah, yeah. I mean, nailed it. Absolutely nailed it. And I mean, one thing I think I think I've mentioned this a bunch of times over the years. But um, one of the things when we we started off as Lord um, mm-hmm. and just sort of you know sort of ended that that final chapter of, of Dungeon and we're sort of getting together and trying to work out what this band was going to be and 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 sort of at least sort of what the the coming years were going to look like. And one of the things that Tim mentioned, which was, it, it'll, I'll never forget it. He said like, and he was really adamant. I mean, he didn't want the band to be, I think he was very conscious of the name Lord and obviously his, his nickname that he uses in the band being Lord Tim. And so he didn't want people to think that it was a solo band or anything like that. And so he really said to all of us, he goes, everyone needs to be a personality. Everyone needs to, you know, put themselves out there and be your own unique person. We are, you know, obviously Lord is a band and we're all, you know, pieces of that, that sum total, but you know, this is more than just me. This is more than just anyone on their own. And so everyone sort of needs to think about, you know, themselves and put themselves out there. We're all characters in a way. And it wasn't so much that we, we forced it, but I think it sort of, I mean, for me, especially, I mean, coming into the, into that situation, it gave me, uh, a little bit of liberty to be able to sort of just be myself and not have to worry about, Oh, I you know, have to, I have to double check everything that I do and make sure it lines in with, you know, whatever Tim wants or things like that. It was just more of a case of like, it, it, it became like this little bit of a, a catch cry for ourselves. It's like, you know, and we've said this quite a bit over the years where we take the music seriously, but we don't take ourselves seriously. And so a big thing of what we've done for, for so long is just literally take the piss out of each other and have a lot of fun and take the piss out more of other handy. things. Yeah, more can handy, absolutely. And, <laughs> and um and some of it, I mean, you know, after a while you start to think you start to think that way and go, Oh, what would be something really fun to do? But a lot of it just comes from a really natural place where we we just love having fun and poking fun and, and just being silly and dumb and just knowing that we've got confidence in our music to back us up. So people don't think we are a joke, but can have a joke with us. And I think that helps a lot. I mean, obviously the music, you know, I mean, I'll, I'll be biased and, you know, and say like the music stacks up, but you know, to get people in, to keep people there, um, music doesn't always, it's not always the, the be all and end all. It has to be other things that people have to identify and have to be, you know, linked in and connected with people and, and go, I like that person, or I like those guys, or I like that vibe or the fun that they have or whatever it is. And then people are a little bit more loyal or they, they want to hang out or they want to go and buy a t-shirt because they just, they like to be a part of, of something that looks to be really fun. So, um, yeah, I'm glad you said that because I think it's something that I see a lot of bands doing a great job these days. And but um, but you are right. There are a lot of bands who just put a release out and then don't do anything else and just sit there yeah, and just, yeah. don't don't engage. And it's just like, oh man, like everyone's got their reasons. But I just think you just I think people underrate sort of how much of an opportunity is missed when you don't take the effort to 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 make those steps to try and show your personality and engage and you don't have to be an extrovert or anything like that. I think it's just a case of making an effort to connect with people and, and have a, have a bit of a two way street. Yeah. And what, um, what, what I'm explaining is, is, is nothing new either. I mean, you had bands like, um, Kiss who did the whole merchandise thing. You had, mm. you even had sadistic execution, you know, putting stickers all around Sydney and everyone was like, Oh, who, who the hell are this <laughs> yeah. sadistic execution? And, you know, them doing strange things outside of, uh, venues. I think, I was reading an interview with Dave Slave. He was he used to like charge people two dollars um, to listen to a, a demo that he had on his Walkman or something, the, the band's demo or something, just so he could. <laughs> or um, him and Rock would beat each other up, and then people would come around, and be like, "Oh, what's going on?" And then then they stop it and just give each give everyone flyers and <laughs> you know if you. 
<laughs> but like you know, if you can if you can make your audience feel involved, if you can, if you can make them feel like they're part of the team. Yeah, it's it's and, you know even even the stuff I'm doing now with Idle Ruin, like um. As as well as doing all the recording posts or the updates or stuff, you know, I might even post an occasional. Uh, I, I posted an article. I think it was from the Hard Times, one of those set on news news sites, yeah. where it was just like the drummer was getting up, oh, the singer was getting up the drummer for not playing a beat correctly. And I'm, and I'm you know, <laughs> because I because I sing and drum for this band, I'm just like, oh god, I hate it when the when the singer tells me to do this, <laughs> you know, shit like that. And you know, people people ate it up. So. <laughs> It's it's all about yeah you know it's those personas things and I mean King Parrot, wow they've they've got that in spades as well you know they do and I think it's I spoke about this just recently with um with Mike from Toe Hider because I think I think they've done such a great job over the years building up you know this really loyal community of people that absolutely love what they do and they feel like they're a part of it and they contribute to it. I think people just really, I mean, not everybody, I mean, everybody's different in their personality, but I think when it comes to, if I want to stereotype music fans or at least heavy music fans, just to really niche it down, I think a lot of them want to be involved or they want to be a part of something that I think it's, it's a little bit that tribal aspect where it's like, I want my team, I want my band, I want, I want, I want some guys to back and support and be a part of. And, and so I think people, maybe not consciously, but I think subconsciously are, are desperate to find out what, who these people are like who are these people yeah. behind the band and what are they like and so when you post a bit of satire on on social media with you know a reference back into yourself and the band i mean people get a glimpse of your personality and your sense of humor and so then mm-hmm. there'll be a bunch of people who may already read you know that or have read that article or are interested in satire or just have a, a similar sense of humor to you and suddenly there's a little bit of that it's like it's like the the connection just forms a little bit stronger than what it was beforehand before you made that post and they're just little little things along the way that over time they they add up and it makes it makes such a great difference and it's all about just being yourself and not having to worry about we are the serious band and and we're just going to post uh, updates on the band and it's going to be very calculated and and uh you know black and white you know this is the release this is the schedule this is what we're going to do this is the show goodbye here's a photo blah blah, blah and that's about it yeah, um, absolutely. Yeah, so it's a, it's a. I mean, I was going to say it's a different time now, but um, but I guess as as you said before, I mean, I think the underlying principles have have always remained the same. It's it, it's the same thing. It's the same need to connect and and have people, you know, um, connect with you. Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. Uh, and yeah, the toolkits have changed. The to- yeah, it's it's just a different approach now. So. You mentioned Idle Ruin, and it probably should have been the first thing I, sp- I was going to speak about, but um, you know, once again, I, got, I you know, get distracted by things. Um, congrats on the EP, and um, you know, I don't know what number band this is for you now. It must be like the fucking fiftieth band that you've been been a part of over the years. I was trying to, I was trying to like piece together a bit of a timeline of, of all the bands that you've been in. I was, I was doing a bit of internet stalking, and I even went on Metal Archives of all places to try and see if there was enough references of all the bands that you've been in. I don't think everything's there, but um, uh, what's hey, this is going to be a really stupid question, but what? Obviously, now you you've got the band, you've got the EP out, and and obviously, I would assume it's very exciting. But for you, that's been a part of music and being in bands and so many bands, and no doubt you've had your fair share of dramas. Was there was there a bit of did you have to push yourself to sort of go into a new project and go, okay, I want to do this. Um. Okay. Uh so yes, yeah I did. Um Do I put you uh, in the spot? <laughs> no, no, no. I'm I'm, I'm just I'm just thinking of uh, thinking of ways to to um Yeah, so uh, Idle Ruin wasn't something I did wasn't something I decided to do overnight. It was something that like I'd been because I'd been after Malachite folded, I I was doing bit parts for different bands around Brisbane and I uh, played in a uh, black metal band called Elkenwood. We did a recording uh, with them, Uh, played in a sort of a, it it was a self-aware parody band, uh, um, power metal parody band called Dragon's Mead. Mm. Um, And also a grindcore band called Decapitated Mum. (laughs) Great times. 
No, they're, they're, they're good dudes. Um, actually, uh, two of the members of D-Mum are, are in Idle Ruin, so... There you go. Um, but, uh, yeah, fair share of dramas. I'm not going to name any anyone in particular, but there was, there was starting to become a very recurring cycle. Mm. So I'd, uh, I'd join a band... And things would be going great. We'd be playing great shows. People would be loving us, being like, you guys, you guys are amazing. Uh, you know, not blowing my own horn, but like people would be praising us, you know. And then, you know, you, you know, you're doing something right when people are praising you. Mm. So it's okay. Well, let's take this band to the next level. Let's uh, do a recording. Let's get out of Brisbane. Let's play some other shows in other states, whatnot. And then we get to the studio. I'd track drums, you know, being being the, the first cab off the rank, I'd, I'd, I'd track the drums. And then um, when it came to other musicians, uh, they'd either be not motivated to uh, record or something would happen that would, you know, change their priorities. And then recordings left in the dust and then the band is imploded. Mm. Big shame because, you know, like I said, people loved us and, you know, we had a good thing going and well, I'm, I'm like, well, I'm not done. And, you know, uh, another band will be like, oh, well, come join us. Okay, sure. Again, rinse and repeat. We'd be playing good shows. People would be loving us. Let's go to the studio. Same thing happens again. Mm. Um, I had one fellow who was harassing me throughout uni to um, play on his solo album. Uh, I said, look, mate, I, I'd love to, but I, I've really got assignments. I've got a lot of, I've got a lot of shit going on. He's like, no, 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 it'll be fine. Just, just, just do it, man. Just do it. I finally do. It's been four years and I haven't heard anything back since. <laughs> You're cursed, mate. <laughs> that, well, that's what I thought. So, um, there was a, there was a band that, really prominent Australian band that uh, offered me a, a, a slot. I, I, I helped them out for a while while they were, you know, while they're having problems with their, their previous drummer and they were like, Oh, come join us permanently. I'm like, oh, I'd love to, but I've got uni. I, I, I can't give that up. You know, I've got my studies. I can't. And now they're doing amazing things. They were, they were set to play Varkin last year, but then mm. coronavirus happened. So I was, I was really kicking myself about that. And, um, and then, you know, the last straw came when, when another band was like, oh, yeah, come play with us. We went and played, um, again, a- amazing shows. Started an EP, you know, just a five-song EP. And then bleh, imploded before it was even finished. I'm just like... But, but between in between all those bands, I was writing songs for a project that I thought, well, you know, I'm going to start for myself one day, inverted, quote, uh, inverted quotes. I'm just like, I'm going to start something for myself. Um, and then when that last recording that I told you about imploded, I'm just like, right, that's it. I'm start th- Today is one day. I'm going to start that band. And um, I'd already had, I think, two... Th- two songs and like just bits and fragments of another song written and all these other bits of, I think one of them was like a rejected Malachite song and, um, put them all together. D mum, decapitated mum had sort of, had imploded at the time. The singer had moved to, to Adelaide and, um, coronavirus was happening we, we weren't sure if, we, if the band was going to gig again so we we're like oh well let's just call it a day that's cool and then you know that was that was a band that was actually you know some good times i had we actually had um some good recordings out on vinyl and things like that and and uh um the bass player of that band josh and um a one-time guitarist of Demom, he uh caleb I was listening to a, a, a podcast interview with him, actually, and he was talking about a similar problem he was having with the bands that he was in. I said, well, um, I'm starting this thing. I'm thinking of just um, recording an EP and seeing how it goes. Would you um, would you like to be part of it? And I was listening to all his recordings. We're like, dude, you, you've got some amazing chops. Like, um, 
I think you'd be, I think you'd be re- really good for this. And um, Josh, his I think there was a band that he was in that had just imploded as well. They were onto something good apparently, like at the time. And I said, well, um, do you also want to be part of this? And yeah, he 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 was he was happy to to jump on and. Um, I completed the songs during the the COVID lockdown. Um, I was between jobs at the time, so I had a bit of bit of free time on my hands. So I'm just like you know, just on Guitar Pro, writing these writing these tunes. I send them to Caleb, and he's like, "Dude, you don't know how to write guitar." <laughs> so he, he he rewrote the riffs so that that you know he could actually physically play them. Yeah. <laughs> I am a I am a drummer after all, and um and I thought, who am I going to get to sing on this? And I thought, well, I'll do it. Um, there was, there was this one time when Malachite were playing a show in the Gold Coast and we'd done our album launch the night before and we were all partying until about probably seven in the morning and Muzz, our vocalist, he'd fucked up his voice. (laughs) So I'm like, well, fuck, I'll do it. And realized I wasn't terrible at it. (laughs) I'm like, actually I can do this. So I thought, well, fuck it. I'll, I'll just do the vocals and drums. I mean... It's not. It's it's not difficult. I mean, it's it just takes a bit of practice, and um, you know, my partner and I we'd actually been planning on moving to the UK last year, and when 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 I thought, well, okay, if I, I could take this band, it could I could take this band to the UK. I could I could get another guitarist and bass player, and it'll it'll be fine. I'll just do drums and vocals. There's that that sort of scalability and and, and transferability about it. So um, we recorded the EP. We did that in, I think, about two, three weeks. Um, and, you know, that was re- originally just going to be a, a project just, just for myself. But then I thought, well, and the guys like Josh and Caleb were like, no, 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 this is, let's, let's push it further. Let's, let's, let's do something more with this. You know, this, we like this. I'm like, okay, sure. Um, if, if, if you're keen, let's do this. So we, we pushed it to um, all the big blogs. They loved it. Um, it's been getting some great reviews so far. Um, we did a, a show on New Year's Eve, which, um, you know, under COVID restrictions, it was a quote unquote sold out show, but <laughs> everyone was going off. It was, it was, it was, we had a good time. It was cool. It looked really cool. Oh, thank you. And, um, and uh, we've, we've, we've just, just, um, recently sold out sold out our first batch of uh, of merchandise so um i'm pretty happy with the the way this is going and um actually just before this interview i was writing some some riffs for the next recording so see how we go. if i'm going to be stuck here in australia for a little while longer yeah, better um, make the most of it yeah better make the most of it well, there you go touch touch wood mate that um you know you haven't haven't continued to to jinx yourself or the curse continues but uh so far so good but i mean that's a that's it that's incredible man i didn't know i mean obviously that's not some stuff that you talk about um you know publicly or or often but um it's it's probably a more common thing that bands go through um in australia and probably in other parts of the world where it's sort of at in a local scene where you're trying to get people together who, you know, are trying to do something and whether it be, you know, by the time it comes into the studio and people get cold feet and, and, and start to get worried about their ability and whether they can actually back it up, you know, they can get away with it live. And then in the studio, it's a completely different, uh, different, uh, battle altogether. Um, but just trying to, trying to keep people afloat and trying to keep people committed. And it's such a difficult thing. And that's why, I mean, I just, I, I just, I'm, I'm always so disappointed when I see like an amazing band and, you know, bands that we played with over the years and form these great connections and you see them do this, this really great stuff and they manage to put something out and then not long later, they just, they implode, they, they disappear and, and you know why, I mean, you don't know the actual Mm -hmm. details, but you know, more, more than likely it's just, it's, it's life. It's the different personalities. It's, you know, what we do is, is not a full-time gig. It's not financially sustainable. And there's a lot of pressures that come outside of, out of the band that, um, that drag us away. And, and, and then there's the, the self-confidence and the self-belief as well. And there's just so many things that work against a musician to get past those early stages of, of a band when you first start, you know, 
gigging and, and putting music together that um, I think when it, when you look at a percentage, I think there's very, very few bands that managed to, to stick around for the first, past the first few years and past potentially a first release, you know, if, if they're lucky. So it's, I guess it's not surprising, but it is surprising just to hear you, you sort of articulate it because I haven't, I haven't heard, haven't heard you talk about it before, but I guess, um, I guess it is something that is probably, probably common, but, uh, mate, I'm, I'm, I'm just glad that you, you persevered. <laughs> you didn't just go, I'll stuff it. I mean, maybe, maybe being a drummer is not for me and I'll, I'll just stick to, to something outside of music, which, you know, that's another thing you see is like so many, so many talented musicians or musicians have got so much potential and, and there's so much great stuff ahead, uh, you know, if they can just stick to it, but, um, they, they pack it in because it's, it's too hard or something, something comes along that becomes a roadblock and they go, oh, well, it's not for me. And it's just, it's just a waste of talent. And they sit at home and get depressed and think about what if, you know, and, and that, that yeah. sucks. Yeah. And, um, it, it, it is very disheartening and like it, it is a team sport, um, for better for, or for worse, like you can be the most motivated or um, ambitious person, but you've, you've, you've got to be on the same page as everyone else or everyone has to be on the same page as you, vice versa. And um, fuck, who was it you were interviewing? Might've been Riley from Desecrator. Mm -hmm. There's definitely a lot of expectation meets reality that yeah. goes on. Like you have these dreams of, you know, let's, let's make music. Let's, let's, let's be famous. Let's get on the road. We're going to, we're going to be, you know, kick ass and then you know there's that dream but like you get into it it's like oh wait this is this costs money oh this this <laughs> takes a lot of time oh yeah. wait oh wait this product didn't turn out the way i wanted it to oh you know it there is a lot of that expectation meets reality thing and um it sucks but yeah some and i think i think unfortunately a lot of a lot of musicians don't have um that sense of third person perspective. Mm -hmm. It's just like, um, like, yeah, if, if you, if you need to quit, that's cool. But also just think about like how it might affect the rest of your bandmates or, or that sort of thing. Like, um, you know, like you've, you've got people depending on you. Um, they might be depending on you to record, to finish recording something. They might be depending on you to, to, to pay for something for, for a tour or something, you know, that, that it is a team sport and everyone needs to play. And, and, and unfortunately not everyone understands that. Yeah. That's a, that's, a, that's a tough one. I mean, there's so many, it's the, yeah, the, the reality sort of, reality check that I think a lot of, a lot of musicians sort of face very, very quickly, especially when you, you start to get into a gigging band and start to understand that, yeah, everything costs money and, and there's a contribution that has to be made. And, and, um, you know, everyone brings their own skills and, and, you know, people do different things, but, um, ultimately it's, it's sort of an, it's an even, even disbursement of, of, of responsibility, um, in different ways. And, and that's a really tough thing. I mean, I think that's one of the, those heartbreaking moments. And, and this is what, just from what you've said, it sounds like you've gone through this multiple times. It's like mm. where you have people that can't just at least fulfill the project or fulfill that next chapter or that next thing, just to, at least if, if you need to move on to be able to say, or go, Hey, I'm going to fulfill whatever the outstanding commitments are first let's tidy this up, let's tie it off in a bow and then, you know, I'll, 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 I'll walk away or, you know, better still, depending on how much of a legend you are, you might even help try and find somebody that can, that can step up in, in your place as well. Um, Absolutely, but, a, yeah. but a lot of people, and I've seen it, I mean, you know, you've, you've seen it multiple times, but I mean, mm. you, we see it from a lot of people that we know, people just disappear because, you know, it's, it's a fear. It's, it's a, you know, saving face, you know, hoping that, you know, if I just disappear and I don't talk about it or I just, uh, you know, stop rocking up to practice or, or the studio or whatever that, um, I won't have to face it. And so I, mm. I can just, uh, you know, stay in denial that, um, you know, I, I, I did the right thing, etc. But, um, as you said before, that third person perspective of seeing what your impact is to others, um, is a huge thing. And I think ultimately, I mean, Tim's always said that in our band. I mean, we've, we've fucking, we've had a, we've had a great run of, uh, of people through our band over the years, especially drummers, very spinal tap ish. But, um, Tim's always said <laughs> whenever we've 
been tense within the band and, and we've all had our, our infighting and all sorts of stuff over the years. I mean, he's always said, look, if people aren't happy, just say it. Because in the end, I'd much rather us shake hands and talk it through and then make the decision to part ways than somebody just drag their feet, have resentment for the situation or have some underlying um, you know, problems with whatever, whatever situations happen and then basically and leave... He's... K- he's been through his yeah and he's been through his share of um oh, like yeah. members who've done that in in dungeon i'm sh- I'm sure yeah yeah definitely and i think i think he's seen he's seen the, the good and bad of it he's seen people that have left with grace and he's been able to maintain friendships after after that person's moved on and i think he's seen the the opportunities and the benefits of 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 people leaving on a, on a great note and so i think for him over the years, I mean, he said it said it multiple times, just like, yes, d- disappointed and maybe even just for the short term, a little bit angry about the situation because, you know, it, it, it results in a lot of work to, to keep the momentum going of the band and all that sort of stuff. Um, but I'd rather that because I'm going to get over that and I'm going to be happy. But if you, if you burn the band and you leave kicking and screaming, then that's really hard. That's really hard to deal with. And that, that's where, you know, it's very, it's very difficult to cut ties in a clean way and, and have people walk, walk away with a sense of pride and and accomplishment. So, um, and that's, that's a level of maturity, which is, which is tough. It's because I think it's just such a unique situation to be in, to be in a band anyway. I mean, if you're just looking at sort of, you know, people in life and, and just normal situations, a band situation is very unique and, um, it's, it's a tough, it can be a very tough situation, you know, socially to, to be in. So it really, you see, you see the good and the bad. And on the other side of the, the, the coin as well, like with Malachite, like that was a band that, you know, I look back and I, I, we, I, th- I think we did, we did pretty, pretty well. You did. Um, and, but there were, there was that one time when, like we got we got the call to get the anthrax support and we're like holy shit we're supporting anthrax this is amazing and that was the first show we did with uh, our singer muzz he 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 just joined the band at the time and then two nights later we get a call saying hey one of our acts pulled out of soundwave you want it <laughs> it's like oh my god we're playing soundwave but at the same time it's just like after we played it i had this sort of fear that i try and push away but it would keep coming back it's just like we've flown too close to the sun (laughs) we have how do we top that how do we (laughs) how do we follow that up you know and so like uh, you know there's there's the bands there's those little engines that couldn't and then there's then then you do succeed at something you might succeed you might peak too early i think that's a, another subject you've brought up in your podcasts as well is mm-hmm. bands that you know you you you, you give it your all in, in your first shot you exhaust yourselves and then splat yep <laughs> there's that as well yeah yeah it's uh Oh, man, there's so many, so many psychological hurdles that you got to jump over, uh, being mm-hmm. in a band because it's such an emotional game as well to play because for the most part, and I can't, you know, obviously, you know, I'm painting a, a broad, you know, broad brushstrokes here across, you know, just musicians in general, but a lot of musicians, the motivation comes from this very romantic, emotional sort of origin story of, of being a a kid or a teenager and seeing your idols on TV or, or listening to a record or whatever it is and, and daydreaming about, oh, maybe I could do that one day and not, and especially sort of previous generations or even I think us as well. I think nowadays it might be a little bit different as people understand a little bit more of the mechanics, but for us, Mm. bands were mysterious. Bands were on big record labels. They were touring the world. They were you know, there was a sense of wonder about them. Oh, yeah, absolutely. And so, so it became really romantic about it. And so, coming now into we're a almost a sense of parody, actually. <laughs> yeah, or well, that that's it. it's it's come it's it's gone in another direction altogether now, as far as the way that that's all interpreted. But um, but I think that that led to a lot of people crashing and burning really quickly because it's not all fun and games. It's not all glory. It's not all big crowds and and adoring fans and success and album sales and touring the world and all that sort of stuff. It's, 
It's every fucking stereotypical shit road story that you've ever heard. It's Spinal Tap. I mean, people joke about Spinal Tap, and, but then you, know, you hear the 80s bands talking about when they first watched Spinal Tap, and they said, we thought it was real because that's all happened to us. All those stories in Spinal Tap, they seem ridiculous, but they, they're all real. They're all Absolutely. things that have happened. So I think, um, I think a lot of bands who are very green and they're starting off musicians, you know, they, I think they dive in really thinking that this is it, this is going to happen. And if it doesn't happen straight away or they find themselves, you know, playing a, a graveyard shift at, at a gig with uh, three payers and they're just sort of looking out going, what the fuck am I doing? And they don't get paid and then they've got to cart their stuff home or, you know, they've, there's no, there's no writer, there's no, whatever it, it might be, whatever, whatever small tragedy there is where no, no groupies in the green room that's for right them, yeah. yeah there's, yeah, or there's, there's one no... there's one guy out the front with bo and he wants to talk to you but um actually he doesn't really he's, he's got no friends and so you gotta you gotta cop that you know if it's uh the, the the fame and glory hasn't quite come yet and for a lot of people they that's where they go nah fuck this this is bullshit yeah this is this is crap and and throw the towel in yeah and the other thing like as i'm getting older and um the experiences that i've had like with malachi yeah, we did play some some pretty awesome support shows to you know even to some of our our heroes. You know, I mean that's 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 a nice little ego boost. But at the end of the day, that that packed hall that you're playing to, they are there for the headlining band, and the 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 mosh pit that was there for us was probably about probably at most the first ten rows maybe, and. That was cool. Like, you know, again, nice little ego boost. It looks good on your resume, whatever. Great. But when I was playing the gigs with d and even the gig I did with Idle Ruin, um, we would play these shitty little shoebox venues. And they were probably about probably, saying probably twice, three times now. Um, <laughs> there were maybe 30, 50 people. These weren't big venues. They were, they were as big as, as, as a bedroom. Mm. And everyone was getting into it. Everyone was there for you. The dynamic was so different. I just, I don't know. The energy of that was so much more enriching than playing those bigger stages with Malachi. I, I, you know, different, different strokes, but I, I enjoyed playing those, those smaller venues with a smaller crowd, like even even if it was a smaller crowd, the, the the venue was packed. It was just about the energy that they they provided, and and the dynamic of the gig. It was just I, I don't know something something I can't really explain a, a, about it, but it was just I've learned to appreciate. I, I not even a case of learning to appreciate it. I just appreciated that that um, a lot more. It, it was it was it was just to me it was just a, a better vibe. I don't know. It's that uh, it's that grassroots sort of thing. It's 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 up close and personal, and it's it's you building your own community and and doing it your own way and seeing seeing the results. And as you said, like everyone in that room is they've made the decision to come out because because of you guys and and you know the the couple of other bands on the bill that you know together you're you're putting on a show. You you guys have put the put the thing together for people to enjoy. And so yeah, I get it. I get it, mate. It wasn't even just a sense of oh. You know, we've gone playing from these big stages. Here we are in this tiny little little shit venue, whatever. It 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 was just a different dynamic, and it just it, it was it was the same sort of uh, amount of gratification, but filtered in a different way. Yeah, yeah, hundred percent, hundred percent. And I, I've um, I, some of the best gigs I've ever played have been been in small venues. I think just the energy and the back and forth and and the appreciation from the people that are there because they they know you, they know your music, and um and yeah, it's just. There's nothing like it. It's just it's different, um, and they're difficult to compare to to anything else or any other type of show situation. But um, but yeah, some of my fond fondest memories are uh, are some of those shows where yeah, it's just um, you know a, a smaller amount of people packed in there, and and just they're there for you, and it's it's pretty it's pretty cool. It's very fulfilling, and I think it sort of validates all of the all the the shit that you've got to slog over the years and all the ups and downs and all the headaches and the, the moments where you go, man, I'm so close to throwing in the towel. Maybe, maybe there's an easier path that I can take where I don't have to stress about other people and, and gigs and organizing things and, and all this sort of drama that I have to deal with, with just being a musician or being in a band. But then, uh, 
then you'll just have these moments. And and I think now, like with you know, I mean, I'm, I'm so envious that you guys got to play a gig, even though I know you guys are back back into a little bit of a lockdown at the moment, or kind of. But um, yeah, we, it ended last night. We go. still got the restrictions, but um, I think we still have to wear a mask outdoors. But anyway, sorry, continue. Yeah, well, congratulations that uh, that you that you ma- managed to get a get a show in there because. Um, I think I think for a lot of people now, it's just trying to find that rush or trying to find that fulfillment, trying to find that connection with people, and we've got to find those ways to do it online and do it remotely. And and I think there's there's definitely ways to do it. It's just a different type of feeling, a different type of rush that you get uh, by by doing it. But um, but yeah, I'm pumped. I'm pumped to 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 know that you guys are you know you you're putting together new music, you're writing new music, and um and the EP's gone well and. And it's cool to hear the backstory as well, because I didn't realize that, I guess, sort of the the origins of it all was more, I think I used this term a couple of times in this chat, is like to scratch that itch for yourself and and not really sort of hard pressed to get it out there and make a big deal about it and and obviously being pushed and, and then here you are now with a, with a cool EP and, 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 you know, out there and getting reviews and getting some attention and, and it's cool. So I'm... Um, Props to you, and it's. And I'm just glad that you. I'm fucking glad you haven't thrown in the towel after all those ups and downs, <laughs> mate. Yeah, I think we've known each other since uh, what that very first band I was in, Metallurgy. Mm, yeah, man, that's a so. that's a throwback and a half, and maybe um maybe a good way because um we'll, we'll have to do another one. We'll have to uh, catch up again because I know we can talk shop for for hours, but um. Maybe a good place to, to wrap it up is um, one of those early memories, and, and I know we have known each other for quite a few years, but um, mm. a memory that I, I look back very fondly, and I'm, and I'm always just uh, laughing when I think about it, is when I was leaving Brisbane to move down to Sydney, and I was joining, uh, getting getting ready to join Lord, and uh, and I had a little gig at my place, at my parents' place, uh, down downstairs in the garage. And oh God, what did I do? No, no, nothing. No, no, just uh, just the just the gig itself. And so we had Metallurgy, so yourself on drums, and uh, and then we had Arcane uh, play as well. So um, so the guys from Arcane are all you know they've moved on and, and and doing different things. Some of those guys bigger and better things as well. And um, just such a wild little thought that um, you know there's a bunch of you guys that were there that. Um, that I'm still keeping in contact with now. And it's just funny that, uh, that there was this tiny little, little gig of a bunch of mates sinking piss and, and having fun and, and playing some tunes. And I think there was a, a few Iron Maiden covers that were, were thrown out as well. And, <laughs> and, uh, yeah, I mean, what was that? That would have been 2000 and 2006, I think Yeah, maybe 2006. So, yeah. so there you go. So, uh, many years have passed. Yeah, different times, definitely. D- different times, absolutely. Well, mate, um, Idle Ruins. So uh, I've got a bunch of links written down in front of me, but uh, where where should people start? What's the best uh, place to direct people? Well, um, obviously, yeah, we're on Facebook, Idle Ruin. That's I D L E R U I N. Um, <laughs> the the guy at our rehearsal studio, as a joke, he writes it as I D O L Ruin. <laughs> Thanks, mate. Uh, <laughs> So, uh, to avoid that confusion. Um, so yeah, obviously we're on uh, Facebook. We've also got Instagram and, um, Bandcamp, idleruin.bandcamp.com where you can, um, we, well, we will have, uh, shirts restocked very soon and, um, you can listen to our EP. Uh, we have a music video on YouTube. We'll have another one up soon. Cool. So, um, heard it first on, on Andy social. Yeah. And, uh, yeah, we'll, uh, we hope to be down your way, uh, sometime this year. Fingers crossed. Uh, mate. Fingers crossed. And, uh, yeah, we'll see how this goes. Yeah. Cool, mate. Uh, well, congrats on the EP. I'll, I'll put the links in and, um, I'll chuck the, the video clip in and depending on when the, the, the new video clip comes out, I might chuck it in as well, or I'll just update sure. it eventually. So depending on when people listen to this, uh, go and have a look and everything will be in there. Um, also, the, um, the thrash metal documentary as well. So I'll put, I might put, um, in bed, maybe episode four, cause you mentioned that was your, your favorite and I'll put some links into that so people can go to the YouTube channel and check them all out. And, um, yeah. Yeah, sure. Um, yeah. Thrash or fuck off. Sorry. Thrash or fuck off is the name <laughs> of the documentary. Um, 
Yeah, it's uh, on YouTube and it's also on osi74.com. There's some extended versions of the episodes on that. Yeah, right. OSI 74 are a video on demand service from uh, the United States. So yeah, that's actually something I forgot to mention. We've actually had um, had the show uh, shown on television in uh, in the US. So wow. that's been pretty cool. And um, yeah, so go check it out. There, there's some extended versions of the episodes up on there. Cool. And uh and for good measure, I'm going to take a photo of the fallout and, oh, uh, God, and don't it, do that. Chuck it in there as well. Just just the front page, mate. That's all. There's a there's a lovely, lovely picture of um, a couple of volume knobs turned up to eleven, and uh, there's a lovely little uh, picture of uh, the guys from Overkill, and um, yeah, yeah, just a nice little reference point that people can have a look at that while we've while we've been having a chat. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you very much, Andy. It's uh, it's been an honour to be part of this, and like you were saying, if you were ever like the whole, um, hey, we should get another fanzine, a metal fanzine or something. I mean, the way that people consume media these days is different. Your podcasts, it, you're pretty much doing it now, man. That, I, that's probably a really good point. I think you just probably stumped me a little bit there. And I guess, uh, yeah, okay, all right. Um, yeah, okay, now the cogs are turning. Um, okay, all right. There you go. I guess I, I guess I kind of am in a way. You better go start a podcast, man. <laughs> I know. Watch tomorrow. There'll be an announcement, <laughs> a new new podcast being launched. But um, oh, well, actually, I mean, oh, look, I, I should wrap it up. But um, I think this year's been a big thing for me as far as wanting to push more into Australian music, and mostly it'll be metal because that's where that's where my my origins are, and a lot of my mates are, and I want to prop them up. But I think just in Australian music in general, heavy music, I think, um, you know, it's it's good to put a spotlight on it. And I think, if anything, and I think after this conversation, it's probably just given me a little bit more clarity as far as the why behind it, because, you know, obviously I want to help people and give people a platform and help, you know, the listeners connect to great music, but I'm documenting it. I mean, even just thinking back to, you know, you mentioned Peter Hobbs before. I mean, I've had him on the podcast and, you know, he's no longer with us, but, you know, I'm just, I'm so happy that we got to have a, a great chat and, and that exists and that, that will exist for as long as I can possibly keep it online. And, and there's countless, well, not countless, but there's, you know, a couple hundred other, other great chats there with, with lots of different people and lots of great stories. So like, like your documentary, I guess this is a, an audio version of trying to capture some of the history and the stories and where people's minds are at at different times, you know, over the years. And there you go. Thanks for, thanks for giving me a, a different perspective on it. That's, that's quite good. <laughs> My pleasure, man. Hey, thanks for listening. Now you can reach out to Liam and crew in Idle Ruin by going to idleruin.bandcamp.com. Of course, they're on the socials, Facebook and Instagram, search for Idle Ruin. I will have all the Idle Ruin links, the uh, Thrash or Fuck Off uh, documentary links, and Liam's social media pages and everything else that we discussed in the show notes over at andysocial.net and andydaling.net. And whatever the hell you're listening to this through right now, there should be a bunch of clickable links so you can just mash your fingers against the screen, click through, and say hi to Liam and the likes. Uh, and check out their world. Now, before we wrap it up, of course, best way to support this podcast is via Patreon, patreon.com slash Andy Dowling. Support starts from only a buck a month. Set and forget. You won't even notice it. Dirt cheap. There are additional tiers for the Patreon podcast episode, which I'm actually about to record right now. I'm sitting in the backseat of my car looking for a bit of peace and quiet. So I'm going to have fun with that. You can listen to those episodes over at Patreon, patreon.com slash Andy Dowling. It is a fantastic way to get behind this podcast. It is the reason why we're still going in 2021. It's the reason why we've ramped up to two episodes per week. A lot of fun, a lot of great things coming, some new merch, lots of silly ideas. We did Team Acrona Plan last year. We may do Team Acrona Plan again this year. I've got so many things that are going to be coming out of the Patreon community and it's all because of the guys that have been supporting. And before we wrap up uh, this uh, particular episode, I must do a little shout out and where the fuck is my little... Uh, list here. Uh, for the month of January, I'm shouting out everybody that's on my Patreon uh, community. Normally, uh, I do shout outs for the top tier guys, but I'm doing it for everybody. So a massive thank you to Ryan from Adelaide, Andrew from Perth, Mick G from Sydney, Ash from Daniloquin, Dan from Dapto, Riley from Sydney, the Tohider guys from Melbourne, Lords of the Triton from Madison, Madison Wisconsin, Sean from Oregon in the US, Johnny from South Australia, Zach from Adelaide, Rod from Rayleigh in North Carolina, Matt from Adelaide, Saul from Oxford in the UK, Patrick from Canberra, Liam from Brisbane, Tom from Melbourne, Chris from Sydney, Frank from Un Frank from Utengruppenbach, 
in Germany, Lewis from Ellie Beach, Turner from Armadale, Samantha from Sydney, Brendo from Leeton, Tim from Canberra, James from Brisbane, Bradley from Canberra, Sean from Melbourne, Kurt from Brisbane, Jason from Adelaide, Christian from Canberra, Cole from Port Kembla, and Jordan from Bendigo. If you've signed up in the last few weeks, my apologies if I haven't... Uh, called you out yet i'm recording these a little bit in advance but thank you thank you thank you very much for being a part of my patreon community and if you haven't got the link yet it is patreon.com slash andy dealing that's it folks another week of podcasting done i've got two new episodes coming next week who they are not even i know they're recorded they're in the bag i just need to pull them out of the out of the bag and work out what order they're going to come out but i'm looking forward to sharing them all with you so stay tuned keep sharing these around and until then take care bye-bye